Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Open Source in Business, a speaker series where we explore a, a diversity of ways that open source has, has an impact on, on the business world and, and the, the, impact, the, the economic and business consequences of, of open source. And today, I have the great pleasure of being joined by Dr. Charles Severance, who's clinical professor at the University of Michigan, better known um, as Dr. Chuck on Twitter and, and around the Sakai world. And we're going to talk about um, uh, Sakai in general, uh, the origin story of Sakai, um, the early days. Uh, uh, doc, how should I how should I address you, Chuck, Doctor Chuck? Yes, Charles? that all works. That all works just okay. fine. Uh, so um, let me well let me first say that the reason why um, I heard about this story is because I read your book, Sakai Free and Freedom, which has been renamed. I noticed as uh, Sakai Building an Open Source Community. Um, just out of curiosity, why was why was the book renamed? Oh, that's a good question. I was in my office and I had all the early uh, drafts of it. Um, partly the reason it was renamed was uh, when I wrote the very first draft of it, I was in a bad mood. I was grumpy. I was uh, and um, and 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 by the time I got done writing it, I realized that I didn't need to be grumpy, and I was sort of unnecessarily grumpy, and I'd gone through a having ref it really caused a forced reflection to write the book. And I realized, okay, there was reasons for a lot of things that happened that made me upset at the time. And so I renamed the book. So uh, the first name was kind of like, you know, power to the people, fight, fight, fight. And and then this, the second name was, you know, we, we, we did something, we accomplished something, uh, warts and all. So it's a, it's, it's a, an incredibly readable book. It's it's like it it just, it's a diary style. Uh, I mean, you wrote it, so you know this, but for the audience, it's diary style. It uh, kind of uh, chronicles everything from uh, really the early days, 2000, 1999, right through to uh, you leaving the the Sakai board in 2006, yep. I think. Um, spoiler alert: You don't don't tell them whether I was fired or quit. Just well, I mean, they've got to read the book <laughs> and find out if I was fired or not. And well, leaving the board is is I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm really interested because one of the things that we talked about just before we came live is is that that period. Uh, 2002, 2003, 2004, there was really an explosion of projects in the education space that were all coming from universities. I wonder, can you can you give me an idea of, of like, first, why that happened and how you got involved? Yeah, it, it was a glorious time. It was a good time to be alive. It was a good time to be in higher education. Um, the, the key was uh, funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation historically has funded libraries and art museums and things like that, because that's what their their business model was, right? I mean, not business, but that's what that was their their guiding principles. And um, at one point, uh, they brought in as one of their directors a fellow named Ira Fuchs, who was a former uh, chief information officer at Princeton. And he thought, I will sort of blur my eyes and decide that making higher education better makes humanities better. And I will try to fix some of the problems I, I refute, saw in higher education. And that was that um, the IT organizations weren't taking the kind of responsibility of managing the explosion of technology, like learning management systems and other things that were going to transform our lives forever, but they were being um, handed over to commercial companies increasingly, like Blackboard at the time and WebCT at the time. And so the, so his idea was is that we ought to like build talent in universities to write software. And if, if he could then bring together a, a coalition of universities to build something, they would have commercial grade software and they would control it. And then universities would own their own destiny. And and he took the melon money and he he put that in as bait in a sense. And so the Sakai project was one of probably 25 projects that the Mellon Foundation funded. And we would every year have like a retreat where all of the Mellon funded um, projects, uh, David Wiley, who later kind of founded, you know, was one of the founders of the Open Education Resource Movement, a lot of really important people were there at the beginning. They were brought together, not by the fact that they were all funded by the Mellon Foundation. And so they were they were also creating a community of thinkers, not just a 
collection of random unconnected projects we were brought together and thought. And so that pretty much was 2000 through 2005, 2006. And okay. um, Mellon went in a different direction after that. And so what happened was is this nice uh, flow of reward and uh, acknowledgement from a third party kind of vanished at that point. And we were left to our own devices. And Sakai was not the only project that was left to its own devices. So you mentioned uh, in your book, the Open Knowledge Initiative as being one of the early drivers of-, uh, of Yeah, of yeah, I would say that, that okay, I was both a driver and a disaster at the same time. Um, you know, the, 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 the biggest, I will just say that probably the first five years of my involvement with Sakai was to debunk the idea that the Open Knowledge Initiative uh, had a, any good ideas. And so the problem was, is okay, I was produced, it was marketed wonderfully, and it there was no there there. And so what happened was, is that everyone felt like, because OKI okay, existed, um, it was the interoperability, uh, learning management systems were just a trivially solved problem because OKI okay, has spoken. And the answer was, is there is nothing there. I mean, I fought that for a very long time. and. Organizations like IMS, who do things like learning tools and interoperability, they were afraid of OKI because OKI said, we are the alpha in this space. We are the definition of truth in this space. And we will stomp on whoever thinks they know what they're doing. And that would be fine if OKI knew what they were doing, but they didn't. All they were doing is marketing a vacuous idea. Um, and doing a very, very good job of it. So in the beginning of Sakai, I had to give lip service to OKI, when in my heart, I knew that my job was to destroy it. Um, I, I was not aware of that backstory. That's, uh, that's, that's interesting. I'm, I'm full of backstories. I'm full of yeah. lots of things. So it, the, that early explosion of projects was not just in the learning management space, right? There was, there was COA uh, managing libraries, um, Kuali managing, you know, campus management, student management, financial uh, software. Uh, there was one I was aware of called Ceres, which was based, uh, which was uh, French universities collaborating with each other. I don't believe that was a Mellon funded one. No, um, and then there's like OLAT, that's a Swiss thing, that's a learning management system that wasn't Mellon funded, and Moodle certainly wasn't Mellon funded. There were other things that were happening in 2004, uh, 2005, yeah. Right? yeah, around the world. It was pretty crazy. It was. Um, it was a good time. So you, you, you got some funding. And one of the things that I find really interesting is, is kind of inflection points in projects. Um, so the launch was an inflection point for, for Sakai. You went from zero to 100 pretty quickly. Exactly. Uh, how, how did you get like all of those early institutions engaged? Was it Did the software come from software that existed? That had been used by the there was this piece of software called chef at the university of michigan and we thought it was really great because we'd been using it with like four thousand students and that would be pretty good right and we were teaching with it even and um the problem was is that we at the university of michigan and at stanford and at mit we'd all written our own kind of hacked up learning systems and none of us really had used even blackboard or webct at the time because we were so smart that we could build our own and so we didn't even know what the core use cases for a, a learning management system were. And so we had the software. And when we wrote that grant in 2000, late 2002, I mean, 2003, and then funded in 2004, I was sure that we were done before we started. Meaning that, you know, I could just like, we had software, we proposed to make software, but I already had software. So this is the perfect grant because it's done before it starts and little, did we know, and that's a lot of what the book is about. Little did we know that I and many of my other co-founding schools and people didn't really know too much about learning management systems. We had built software um, that was interesting and cool, but it wasn't scalable. It wasn't didn't have a feature set that the commercial folks did. And, and so, but we didn't even know that. And the people who were we would we said we knew what we were doing. We said we we're geniuses. And like if you take MIT, Michigan and Stanford and you like they're pretty smart folks. Right. And they yep. say they know what they're doing. And so that ought to count for something. But we didn't know what we were doing. And so everyone sort of was drawn into the idea. And um, 
And during that time, we were like, by October 2004, we were on the lips of everybody because Blackboard and WebCT had both made some really bad moves. They had been moving from their basic editions, uh, campus edition to the WebCT Vista and Blackboard we Learn. And that was a rough, rough transition, really rough transition for both those companies. And so the right. companies were not in a position where they were making their customers better. There was no commercial learning management system in 2004 that really was making its customers happy. And so, so that was where like Sakai and Moodle had their opportunity. Sakai and Moodle around 2004, we walked into a situation where everybody hated their current vendor or they were writing their own. Um, because there were no real good vendors out there. And so Sakai got a lot of attention because everybody was ready to switch to anything. And here are these th these schools that are saying, we're going to do this and we're awesome and we know what we're doing. And two of those, th two of those things were right. <laughs> the one about we knew what we were doing, that was not so right. Now, right. by the end of 2006, we did know what we were doing. And by, by the end of 2006, we, we had learned a lot. And um, certainly by 2007, three years in, and it and and in some ways we can laugh at um, our hubris for stepping into a, a a ring where we had never thrown a punch, right? Um, but sometimes that is what gets you in the game, and that's right. just table stakes. And then you got to fight your way out of the mess that you created for yourself. And by 2007 we were a very talented group of people and we really knew what was going on and we really were working well together. And, and, and ultimately, that's what led to me leaving the project for a while. And that was right. the fact that um, as a leader, I am better when things are not going well. I'm very good at projects in crisis and digging things out of crises. And I'm proud of what I did um, but at some point we woke up and we actually had good software and we weren't in a crisis anymore. And then second order effects started to come in and the fact that I wasn't as polite to certain people as I probably should have been uh, turned out to matter. But when we were three months away from complete and total abject failure and I was the solution to that problem, then people would tolerate, um, as, as one of my dear friends says, I'm an acquired taste. I mean, I'm... <laughs> I, I, over a long career, I've acquired a particular set of skills, skills that are very useful when you need to write something <laughs> in a hurry, but skills that piss people off when I tell you that you're wrong and you're wrong. And so, I mean, I don't, I didn't have time to suffer fools and we had plenty of fools in our project. I thought you were doing your Liam Neeson. I am doing my Liam Neeson. <laughs> <laughs> I bring the Liam Neeson there. quote in every time I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, one of the things I love about projects that come out of uh, user communities as opposed to, you know, people who are using them as opposed to people who feel like they're building something that other people should use yeah. is is that you really, you're using it. So you, you, you bump off all of the sharp angles all of the time, you know, all of your user community um, and developer community experiences are based on, you know, actually getting that live feedback. How valuable was that in the early days of the project? It was, well, in the first part, all we knew was what we didn't have. And so we were talking, all we found out was a long inventory list of what we didn't have. But once we solved kind of that first thing, which took us about three years, um, it was my greatest joy to be a faculty member at the University of Michigan and have commit rights on the software that I was using on a daily basis. Uh, as a learning management system. I mean, it would take me a year to write a feature and get it in production, but uh, you could, I could round off the rough edges, at least in the parts that I used. And, and, I, and, and so um, it's amazing. And, and my university now uses a private equity owned, sluggish, boring, non-changing learning management system. And I just found a feature that just like, just just set my hair on fire of this learning management system and I just wanted to shake somebody. Had it been Sakai, I would have just gone and fixed the damn thing if it was as broken as this cloud-based LMS that we're not currently using. Yeah. And I might've had to wait, but in a semester or two, the damn thing would have been fixed, right? Yeah. And so these are those rough edges that at some point, uh, when you get furious at something, you can go get it fixed. Or the, and the, other, the other thing that's cool about Sakai is 
we have meetings and just random faculty show up to these meetings and there's a bunch of developers and the project managers and the Q, uh, QA people and the UI people. And then a teacher will just start complaining. We'll be like, hmm, let's listen for a while, right? We don't always do exactly what they say, but there is no other environment other than Sakai where a faculty member can stumble in to the most core development meeting that's going on once a week on Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock and just complain about the product and have 10, 15 developers going, hmm, you have a point there. I mean, you can't do that in any of the vendors at this point. If you don't yeah. like the product, that's, that's, the, you that, can't. that's the core value of open source is the connection that you have between users and yeah. developers. And, and now, and the open, on the know. other hand, we probably one too many times have listened to a faculty member who said, I need two more checkboxes where there's one checkbox that needs to be three checkboxes. And then people go, your product's too complex. And then when you try to take out those two checkboxes, then, then one out of 400 people say, oh, you ruined it for me. And so mm -hmm. it leads to a complexity and we don't have as good a way to reduce that complexity uh, as I would like. Mm -hmm. um, although we, we, we now, we now are a little slower at just adding a feature every time someone shows up with a, with a use case. And the ability to build a tool outside the system with learning tools interoperability takes some of the pressure away that, that every use case has to be met by this one product with 40 checkboxes, basically. I used, I used to work on the GNOME project, and yeah. uh, a developer called Havoc Pennington wrote a, a very influential to me essay about uh, a, a window manager that was introduced in the early days of GNOME 2. And um, he described a kind of a paternalistic approach to building software. Um, figure out what's broken, and rather than adding an option to unbreak it, um, make the default better. Uh, so it's kind of paternalistic, and certainly GNOME has been criticized. And we've definitely had some of those conversations where you know Linus Torvalds uh, was complaining about not being able to switch mouse button options, and um, you know, so definitely some of the options that we've taken out have been have 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 angered uh, community members. But uh, it's uh, yeah, it's it's that constant tension between you know providing the flexibility and just providing core functionality. So, so Dick actually has a really good question, and that is how do you resolve conflicts on requirements like how to focus funds? So that took a lot of growth on our part, right? And um, we we spent a lot of a lot of time. Um, we spent a lot of time where we would have meetings, and we would take votes, and we would make long spreadsheets, and we would make priorities, kind of like a university would do with a say a faculty committee that's advising the IT organization. And you'd say, okay, you're going to have um, two FTEs of work that you can allocate, and so where do you want to allocate it? Um, and and and, uh, and and that didn't work. And that's because uh, the squeakiest wheels always won the argument. If you were loud and lasted long uh, enough, you would drown out everybody else, and you would just vote and vote, and everybody like, I'm, I, I, and this meeting's too long. I'll vote for anything. Just get me the hell out of this meeting. And then we end up with a bad decision. Right. And that was dysfunctional. And so you think that votes and the, the way you go into a forum and hit the like button or something, and that's how you're going to make decisions is terrible. Um, it turns out that what we learned was if people feel strongly enough to write a check, then maybe that's a good idea, right? And so the people who just come in and start yelling with no resources behind them, we don't let that happen anymore. We basically say, show us resources. And the other thing we do is once someone has an idea and they want to put resources behind it, then we actually try to create a smaller group of people who will throw more resources at the problem and then help guide it so that it doesn't just meet one set of needs. And so we've been pretty, we've been pretty fortunate by saying, don't just come into our meetings and yell at us. Come into our meetings and then start writing checks. And, right. and when people write checks, they think more about what they're trying to do. And when they write checks, then people take a look at what they're trying to do. Or start writing code. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and we, we had a really cool example of, uh, of something that you, I don't know when you're going to see it from the mainstream uh, vendors, and that is dark mode. And you look at the Blackboard desire to learn a canvas, and then their ability to change their markup to go to dark mode is hard. It, will, it was hard for us. And if you'd have asked us to prioritize it, I would say, you know, I'd rather work on session migration because that is a great performance improver. And I would like to work on this and I'd like to work on this. 
LTI feature, not dark mode. But a school, Duke University said, dark mode's our thing. Leave us alone. You guys go work on all the stuff you want to work on. We're going to work on dark mode. And so in Sakai 21, we have dark mode. I'm like, wow, you just went off and did dark mode because you were a customer and you just wanted it. And you your priorities were different than the rest of our priorities. And the rest of us, we worked on the technical things we felt were important. And then dark mode just appears. And and we didn't, and, and, you know, if it was late in delivery, we didn't care. We weren't yelling at them. We're like, so you're playing with dark mode. That's pretty cool. So pretty awesome. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, Dirk did raise another couple of questions that I want that I also have on my list of things to ask. And that's Those um, are all great questions, by the yeah, way. Yeah. The, so the, the, write a book. About inflection points and, and hitting inflection points. Um, the funding runs out when you're when you're uh, funded by a foundation. You mentioned that the, yes. the, the Mellon funding eventually ran out. Uh, so the schools that had been getting that funding to work on Sakai um, had to figure out how to make the project um, run on its own, either with volunteer effort or commercial support or some other funding model. Right. Um, so how do you convince schools that are using free software, open source, uh, that it's actually in their interest to you know, contribute some money to a common pool so that the, so that the development of the software is sustainable? So these days in Sakai, that's not hard at all. We had we have schools that just come write hundred thousand dollar checks all the time because the alternative is write a million dollar check to a cloud vendor, right? And so they write a hundred thousand dollar check this year, and then you know their prices are a lot lower. And so we have never had, not recently. So so over the past five years, we have more money in Sakai than we have developers who can get things done. Um, and so. But there, that wasn't always the case. Um, there was uh, really three particular phases of uh, three phases of a Sakai. We're now in the good phase. The first phase was Mellon funds. The second phase was after Mellon funds. The founding university shouldered an excessive amount of load, and so Stanford, Michigan, Indiana, did a lot of work way more work than they deserve to be asked to do. And they would go to the Sakai conference and have the founding schools at the front of the room and the adopting schools would be whining at them as if the uh, University of Michigan was their vendor, right? You go whine at the vendor and the vendor goes, well, maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't. And we, it got like that. And so it turned out that by 2010 or so, it felt like a terrible liability to have been one of the founding members of Sakai. Once or twice a year, you got yelled at by the mm -hmm. customer base for not doing more. And the University of Michigan was spending close to a million bucks a year on Sakai. So and, you were actually spending money on developer salary. Oh yeah, it was great. I mean, there was, <laughs> you were a faculty member, you walked in and we'd say, we got your back. We know what, what you need, we will get it done and we will figure it out a way and we'll change the product and everyone will benefit. And it was a glorious time, but it wasn't a sustainable time because okay. being yelled at for spending a million dollars is not very fun. So you'll note that all the founding schools went to Canvas in like a six month period, right? The moment Canvas kind of broke out, they're like, we're out of here. And it was as much, beca not because they hated Sakai or Sakai was bad or they weren't being successful with Sakai. It was the fact that they had been they had been treated badly by the rest of the Sakai community, and at that point, presumably, they were spending more than they would have spent on on Canvas. They would like to say that, but Canvas is pretty expensive, and I think they're probably spending twice as much on Canvas as they were on Sakai. Even though their their case at the time was we're going to save money, it was. But you didn't, but you didn't have the mutualization of the costs across. Well, it wasn't the so much mutualization because if you were a if you if you did want to just buy Sakai from say our one of our cloud hosting vendors like Longsite, it was it's like a quarter of Canvas for the same kind of service. Oh. Um, so you if all your goal was is to save money, um, Sakai is still way cheaper than Canvas, but that wasn't that wasn't their point. The Stanford, Indiana, and Michigan the, to be associated with Sakai meant being mailed. And so, and I think that we we felt at that time that um, that that was not a bad spend because um, we were getting a lot of control 
but that spend was then connected to being criticized. And, and it's pretty hard to spend money and then get criticized for the spending of the money. Thank you for the 950 bugs you fixed this year. Oh, and by the way, I'm pissed because X. And so, yeah. but now what we've got is nobody that's in the community right now, other than maybe me, considers themselves a founder. I am the only remaining founder. I'm not a school, I'm a human. Um, and I'm not even the smartest human. human. And so I just kind of come along and give talks and stuff. And I don't, I don't, I'm very non-paternalistic, right? I, I don't put myself above anybody else. And then what happened was, is as soon as those founding schools left, then the other schools sort of rushed in. Okay. And, um, and places all over the world rushed in. And so now what we have is we have uh, folks that don't feel like they deserve it, but they also don't feel like they're outsiders either. And so the community that we have, as small as it is, is a wonderful community and uh, there's very little barrier to participation. There's very little sort of sense of entitlement. Um, and so things go pretty well. But in those early days, 2004, 2006, you also had a very visible and, and um, um, significant vendor, Rsmart, yes. that was involved in the project and was- Rsmart and you were But Rsmart was the one that was trying to put Sakai into a cardboard box and sell it. Right. and. Um, so let's, because this is one of the things that I found most interesting about your book is, is that the tensions that existed around that period where a lot of the development work was being done by the schools yep. and RSmart was commercializing it yep. and was essentially trying to convince, is my understanding, the Sakai community that the schools that were working on Sakai should make the project better so that they would sell more. Um, and there was some tension between how, what kind of resources are our smart bringing to bear on the project versus the benefit that they're hoping to get out of it. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about those tensions and, and uh, without, you know, being too mean, without um, being too mean, I, I don't want to make well. you to speak ill of people. No, <laughs> um, you summarize, you summarize it very well. And that is that, um, our smart didn't really want to be judged based on their contributions. What they wanted to do was inject themselves in a process that all the work was done over here and then our smart was in the middle and then all the customers were over here. Right. And so we were just supposed to be a bunch of hippie creators that just love coding 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then our smart would take our mess and clean it up and even schools like say Michigan they wouldn't mind if they would just install the RSmart distribution. Now there's a model that's like this right and you work for that company right or there's like a bunch of hippies over here there's kind of a packaging thing in the middle and then there's the people that you encourage to not talk to the hippies directly but instead work through that packaging company and so that was the intended model and if you look at Red Hat and if you've known Red Hat for long enough, you understand that it's not as simple as Red Hat in that picture, right? I mean, it's Red, that was the, the kind of starting model of Red Hat, right? And it was, it was a useful model, but ultimately Red Hat has had to become a philanthropist. Red Hat has had to become uh, a, a, a good citizen. It, it can't be a jerk and it doesn't get to have exclusive anything. It has, to, it has to be seen as adding value where it adds value. And so, you know, in 2004, people looked at the Red Hat model and said, I wanna be like that and I'll just be a billionaire the next day and IBM will buy me. And that's what the idea was. But then they had to, in a sense, cut out anybody going out around them. So we wanted to have commercial affiliates, a diverse population of commercial companies, and we do now. Um, our smart's not one of them, but our smart felt like any commercial vendor should have to license the our smart product. They weren't a commercial vendor should not use the Sakai product. They should use the our smart product because well, I wasn't our aware of that. So did, did you had difficulty building a, an an ecosystem of vendors around around Sakai uh, because our smart was attempting no, to no no. No, that's just what they wanted. They, they were okay. absolutely not allowed to get it, but this is what led to some of the tension in late 2006, right. early 2007, 
where I'm like, I mean, the, the community follows me. If there's any paternalistic symbol, it's me. I don't act paternalistic, but I am a paternalistic symbol. And I was not, they wanted me to like tell everybody to follow this path. And I'm like, I will quit or be fired before I tell an open source community that the solution, it'd be like Linus saying, the only way to get Linux is through Red Hat. That's what they want. They wanted right. me to say, the only distribution of Linux, Linux is cool, I'm Linus, and I'm gonna keep making Linux, but the only distribution you should ever use is the Red Hat distribution. And if somehow you go back in time and Red Hat could make that happen and bribe Linux or Linus or something, I don't think the world would be as good as it is today. I mean, that doesn't mean the Red Hat doesn't add a lot of value. And this is where it kind of went wrong for Sakai and Smart is that Smart had one way of thinking about it. They just okay. couldn't think about it as we have to be stewards of everything that we do and we have to be giving. And so they, they wanted to take, they wanted exclusive, they, they wanted to just turn a money crank and our growth was their growth and no growth happened outside of them. And uh, I, it didn't happen. I, I kicked them out. To the so who owns the, um, the Sakai mark, the trademark? Oh, the Sakai trademark was owned by the Sakai Foundation and uh, now is the Aperio Foundation. And so, yeah. Okay. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's, so it's com company owned and company run and you have Kind of a level playing field trademark guidelines. Uh, yeah, yeah, and you, 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 to be a commercial affiliate, you have to, you know, join, and we can kick you out if you uh, don't have the right ethics. We have not kicked anybody out, but there have been folks that have had bad ethics and left. Okay, uh, so uh, Dirk asks if it's a better idea to um, commercialize the project in the way that Kuali did, and have a single vendor uh, around the the project that's a kind of an identifiable vendor for the project? Or is it better to, to try to build this ecosystem of, of, uh, of vendors? So that's really two questions. The first question is, did Quali do it right? And the answer is absolutely not. Quali's unqualified disaster, in my opinion. Everything about it was an unqualified disaster. Um, and if you look at them 10 years later, they have like the exact seven customers that they had when they were founded. And uh, Kuali Co. was not a wisely conceived idea. Kuali Co. was so that Indiana University could run from responsibility and just leave the bag on the doorstep of Kuali Co. So here's all the money. Here's all the customers. I'm out because this is getting actually complex and I don't have the talent to actually do this. I'm just leaving. And so Kuali was just an unqualified disaster. It wasn't right. That's the first question. The second question is, um, oh, by the way, Smart was involved in quality as well. Um, I was aware of that. Yeah. The, the second question is harder and, and more subtle and nuanced. And that is, if you were starting today, um, what role does a commercial company have in an open source project? And could you construct an open source project with one commercial com com company as the um, as, as like a founder, as it were. Like, no commercial company really founded Sakai for, uh, for universities founded it. Um, and this is something that I think about um, more and more. And you see things coming out about OpenLMS. You watch Canvas, not as it was intended, but how things are kind of turning out for Canvas. And then you look at things like Elasticsearch and you scratch your head and you say to yourself, is Elasticsearch right? And for those who don't know Elasticsearch, um, I used Elasticsearch for a decade before I really e realized that there was a company called Elasticsearch. I thought Elasticsearch was just a bunch of hippies and a GitHub repo. Um, but Elasticsearch is like a billion dollar company. I think it might be a Dutch company if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, uh, yeah it's a Netherlands yeah. company. And it's built on Apache Lucene. Is, is of course, it, built on Apache Lucene. Yeah. Apache is a, is a real hippie open source thing. Although a lot of Apache projects tend to be a small company of two or three consultants in a piece of software. Um, but those or even a bigger don't. company, like uh, uh, what's the, um, there are some of the uh, business process management uh, yeah. projects in Apache that are that have a vendor like Day behind them. 
Yeah, Day. Day, Day Software is a perfect example, like uh, JSR 170 and Day Software, for example, was there. And so that that's a, a, a pretty solid model. Um, the key to that is I, I think you would find that most of those companies that you could think of as kind of like the shadow founders of open source projects, they're often European. They're not often American. And that's because European culture doesn't tell every single child the moment they're born and come out of their they start crying and say, when are you gonna make a billion dollars? For every child in America, you gotta go after a billion dollars. And there's right. just, there's only one good way to make a billion dollars and that's hurt a billion people for $1. And you don't make a billion dollars by doing good. You make a billion dollars by hurting people. Yeah, and what's, the, what's the line, the, um, somebody talking about the American taxation system saying the problem with um, raising the taxes in the rich on the rich in the US is uh, everybody thinks they're a temporarily embarrassed millionaire. Exactly. They're just, no, they're not rich yet. They're just not they're rich. Not rich yet. Yet. Yeah. They're not rich yet. And so, and so you'd see that a lot of these companies that uh, are successful supporters of open source and successful founders come from European, where you find small European companies that have 10 to 20 employees are completely satisfied with a really good income, good health benefits, working with people you like, building software you like and having customers that you like and realizing that 30 people is all you need to be because you live in the West End of London and you can go to a show anytime you want and get chips at two o'clock in the morning. And you don't need the billion dollars to be happy because if you live in the West End of London and go to a pub and get chips and go to a show, you don't need a billion dollars to be happy. We're in America, if you don't have a billion dollars, you're not happy, damn it. So you better be working on that. And so so these, these kind of founding companies that keep their values intact tend to not get greedy and not get large. Elasticsearch is the interesting exception to that, although it is a European country company. Um, it almost could be a country, but it's a European company. And so we see this in, the, uh, in, in this where, uh, where a high value, high moral value organization can lead an open source project. It, and, and I mean, I, been in conversations with Phil Miller, who's a dear friend of mine, who runs Open LMS, which is the kind of commercialized Moodle thing, and he just went open source. And I'm like, uh, what does that mean, right? Uh, yeah, you're releasing your stuff. It's a GitHub repo, and that doesn't mean anything. Um, the thing that I love about Elasticsearch, and I'm not, Elasticsearch is probably at this point, in my mind, the closest to a good, modern, open source, highly sustainable project. And here's the, here's the key thing that Elasticsearch did that I don't think I've seen from really any other company. Or if I did, I didn't even notice it, and that's what's important. What's important is that Elasticsearch feels like the people who are using their product and not paying for their product are as important of a customer to them as the people who are paying them for the product. So, so lots of open source, open source, like, say, Canvas, like they go like, yeah, it's open source. And all we're gonna do is try to convert you to a commercial company, com a commercial customer, right? And so it's just a trick to get you as a commercial customer. And I would love to meet some of the Elasticsearch people. Like, do you really think in your heart of hearts that like me as the open source guy who hasn't paid you a single penny for using Elasticsearch for a decade? Am I valuable to you? Or am I just a drag that you wish I would pay you money? And I, I hope, I dream that Elasticsearch really doesn't mind if you pay them or not. I, I don't know if I'd hold them up as the exemplar, uh, to be honest. I, I wish I knew a better one, and I, I, I'm not gonna give them an A plus, right? But, yeah. but I mean, it's, it's not, it, at this point, I, I don't think it is, uh, I don't think we can call Elasticsearch open source anymore after the well, license change to SSPL. And that's the problem, right? And that the problem is, is once you become a billion dollar company, it's really hard to not sort of, push your advantage, right? And so this is where you go back to these 10 to 15 person companies, they tend to, they tend to stay cool. They don't, they don't kind of, and so we have a company in Sakai and we would be lost without them. Mm -hmm. And they're called Longsight. They're our kind of number one cloud hoster. They are probably our number one contributor at this point, but they're only, I don't know how many there, let's 10, 12 people, but not 250, right? Okay. And and so we have money to sustain it. And those people are paid well. We're all good friends. And you can't really almost tell where 
our commercial folks stop and our open source people start. We're all in the same meeting. Nobody like says, well, you're not from my company, so I have to make you fill out a special form before I look at your commit, right? And so I, I would say, I'm, I'm, I'm totally unbiased here. I would say that the most perfect open source commercial product relationship, commercial company relationship, is Sakai and Longsight. Now, I'm completely unbiased in that, um, but I study it all the time. And I'm great friends with Sam uh, Otnoff, the founder of Longsight. He, the interesting thing about Longsight is unlike Unicon and Rsmart who came in when it was the gold rush, they came, Longsight came in like 2008. And then by then we were an established product and we weren't sort of like, ah! and they're just like, let's, let's make some money and help put some code in here and fix some bugs. And, and they did, and they made some money and they they continue to be a great folks. And they don't seem, they don't think that they're better than anybody else. They're, but we really depend on them and they're really good. And, and I think that as long as they don't become a billion dollar company, will that relationship will stay. And so if I was to start it right now, going back to the question, I, I would want a company, but I would somehow want that company not to have as its goal, make a million, make a billion dollars, right? To be a lifestyle company, right. to be a company where the joy is. And so, and so for me, it doesn't have to be a nonprofit. I, I, there's lots of for-profit companies that I love working with because I know that they're small. I know that they're happy and I don't, that they don't crave something that they're not. Mm -hmm. And so if I can trust them, invest in them, let me just give you a really tiny example. When I started teaching my the world's most popular Python program, most popular programming course, Python for everybody, I told people to use a free text editor called Text Wrangler. And so I just said, hey, download this Text Wrangler and I'll do all my samples in class in Text Wrangler because I wanted to open source uh, a free product. Well, I probably took the downloads of Text Wrangler and multiplied them by 50 by the time it was all said and done. But also two years later, Text Wrangler was spammy. It installed, it installed trackers and it, people are like, why are you telling me to download this thing that is just so spammy and full of trackers? And then they stopped with a free one and they made another thing that was not free. And as soon as you get the free one, it tells you to buy the other one. And here I am to hundreds of thousands of students advertising a product that through two years ago was just a happy little product in the corner that, that, that people were using mm -hmm. and I could recommend it. And so again, sometimes if things get too good, then folks get, um, yep. And these things evolve with time. Yeah. Um, but I'm interested right now. You mentioned that uh, that long site, long 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 site, long site um, is probably your biggest contributor. Yes. But um, there are many other contributors. There are how many developers working on Sakai now? Roughly, order of magnitude. Probably twenty people that put in five to five hours or more a week. Okay. And how many? Which is how many very efficient. Which is amazingly efficient compared mm -hmm. to any of the commercial vendors. It's amazing how far we've gotten with such a small team. And there's a reason for that. Yep. And that is, we don't have central administration and we don't have central management and no one gets yelled at. Everyone's happy. Everyone's working on things they want to work on. Everyone's in a good main state. And so we're just more efficient than a lot of other development organizations. Now, how many people working full time? Uh, probably six or seven. And do they all work for long, uh, long site or? I think so. Okay. Because uh, my question was going to be, you know, when you have people in a university who are contributing maybe 20 hours a week, um, that's, you know, that's a part-time job. Are they doing that out of the goodness of their heart or, or is the university funding development to do, do, do any of the right there now are, the practitioners fund? Yeah, there's probably no one working at a university that's working more than 10 hours a week on Sakai at this point. In the, in the phase two, where Michigan, Stanford, um, Indiana, there were probably four to five full-time people coming from each of those universities. Okay. Uh, can we talk about um, usability in the early days of Sakai was obviously a big concern. And that was kind of yes. the flashpoint of, uh, of the conflict between, between uh, you and RSmart was, uh, and it's, it's a criticism, you know, when I, when I uh, talk to some people I know in, in education, certainly uh, that was the big early criticism of- It's still of, a criticism. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's still a criticism. Uh, so how, how has the project addressed that in terms of uh, 
like a funding usability work did and how that happened around the Sakai Foundation at the time, and b um, on an ongoing basis. How do you do? You, do you have kind of designers and user experience contributors? Yeah. So. So there's there's lots of things like that, like accessibility is another good example of something you might say. How do you how do you get time and how do you find time to work on accessibility? How do you find time to work on usability? And it's taken us a while to figure that out. Um, so the, so the, the first observation is that um, we don't lack for willingness on the part of our folks to invest in usability. And so if you said there's a usability project to do X, Y, Z, money would sort of start coming out of the woodwork. And so it's not that, um, because our customers see that as a priority, right? Because they have to kind of defend our product against all the billion dollar products out there. And, um, and so if our product is short on some usability area, they are willing to they could either you know, write a check for a million dollars a year to a cloud vendor, or they could write a hundred thousand dollar check to get some usability stuff fixed in our thing. And so it's not like, it's it's not for lack of money. Um, the thing that we had to get past you know, early on is um, people giving impassioned speeches about how important their lens is, and all the other lenses should go to hell, um, and 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 then the problem is, is once you kind of go into this, my lens has got to be the winning lens, like usability has got to be the only lens or performance has got to be the only lens or accessibility has got to be the only lens. And and my lens is the is the top lens and all you other lenses, you live underneath me. Um, we solve that by not saying any lens is the winning lens. And the one that, the one that tended to win in our mid phase tended to be technical people like me, um, because we represented uh, resources that I could allocate my own resources, right? If you tell me to work on X or Y or Z, and I want to work on Z, I'm going to work on Z, right? Because I'm a volunteer, and so I'm going to work on that. Um, and so in the middle phase, a lot of the technical stuff got kind of won in an argument where there was kind of a trade-off. And there's sort of, there was like, like the accessibility or usability tended not to win, but now, um, what we have is we have different working groups and there are different schools and commercial folks that show up at different things. There's like the core team, the technical team, the forms team, the usability team, the accessibility team, the QA team. We have like seven, eight meetings and a marketing team. We have seven, eight meetings every single week about Sakai. And so what happens is that um, if you're interested in our usability, there's a there's a there's a meeting, and you go to that meeting, and the other people interested in usability, um, you know, go to that meeting, and all of a sudden, someone starts writing checks about usability, and someone says, "Oh, I think we should take that one little question mark, and that needs to be replaced by a an icon that looks like a a, a you know a gas can." And Do you end up with a kind of a, a bike shed effect? Uh, I don't know if you're aware of the the bike shed, but um. Yes, because because one of the again another I know what about experience from, from all about bike is, uh, is, um, so is the so the, um, bike, the thing that's our bike shed right now is if Canvas does something and it's stupid, everyone still wants it, right? Because everyone says, "Well, Canvas is great," so you look at it and say, "I use it every day. I use it every day. It's not great. It's not a great product." There, are, technically, I like it a lot. But from a usability, it's it it's simple, and that's in, to its credit. It's simple, right. but it's it. There's lots of things I don't like about it from a usability perspective. And the thing that bikes the bike shed part that frustrates me the most is that if you take a random group of people and they spend five minutes with Canvas, they find all the things that are different in Canvas than Sakai, and they say that's what we got to change. And I'm like, actually, if you actually use those exact five features, the first five features you notice. That's where Canvas is the worst. And so we kind of have this thing where everyone wants to find a thing that Canvas does differently and claim that that's their brilliant observation about what we do wrong. Right. And instead of looking at what we do wrong, and we do a lot of things wrong. We, and, and so it's for, as a forced Canvas user, they, would list, they, they might want to listen to me, but they don't want to. They listen to people who don't actually use Canvas 
Um, and so that's kind of the bike shedding, but I just have to stay away from that. Right. Right. I can't, I can't, I, I, I put little tiny things in, but, uh, but ultimately there's, there's plenty of bike shedding, but the thing that fixes bike shedding is when people start writing checks. And so if someone really wants a feature and they start writing a check in the usability I mean, working it, group, then it happens and it comes in and it's merged. And not that anyone was opposed to dark mode, but dark mode ran on its own little right. schedule with its own resources. And it was awesome and no one was opposed to it. It's just, it wasn't going to be a whole bunch of people's top priority because there was two, there was different lenses and each lens can advance at the pace at which it can advance. And so that's, it's, it's cool. And so well, we, well, we well, get well, things well, done well, and our well, usability well, is well, better. Well, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one uh, of the lessons I take away from, from um, Gnome, Gnome again, yeah. uh, a bit of an echo here, um, is that usability is, is a skill. It's, and it's a lot of the people who care about usability don't actually have that skill. Um, and, and there is a need for usability to be, to be, uh, to, for usability to improve over time in a project. Uh, there is a need for the people who care about the technical features, the, the engineers working on the project, to actually be willing sometimes to do things that they don't think is a good idea because the designers who are working on the project and, and, and have that skill say, actually, this is going to make the project better for everybody. Yeah, the problem I have with, with usability is, as a user of the product, um, usability is almost exclusively aimed at like a visual thing, right? Um, this product is better because it has more white space on each div. They just put padding on every div. And so they're a better product because padding around divs is a cool thing. And if you don't have padding, um, and, and so for me, what usability really is, is the ability to get my job done with uh, get out of my way, right? Don't create a user interface that makes my job difficult. And sometimes that's sort of hidden technical things like an import or an export process, which is hundreds of thousands of lines of code that affect me greatly every time I switch semesters, right? Um, and usability, if that doesn't work, I don't care how pretty your padding is. Right. So some of usability is 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 features and capability. But the other thing that's that I'm I'm really learning is that ultimately there's like the internal state of this software in the database or something, and there's things I can click on to cause that internal state to change. And one of the books I read about usability is that we need to reveal to the user what they're capable of doing with these systems, right? Not not just say, how do you want it to look? No, at some point these systems have capabilities and we have to efficiently reveal what their capabilities are and let them change the internal state of the system in a way that doesn't get in their way. It's, and that's the user experience. That's like, I need to get some work done and it's gonna take me 10 minutes or two hours to get my work done. And it, none of that has to do with padding, although padding is important and things that are pretty like dark mode are important, but, um, it, it's it's difficult until you really get experienced faculty who can also put their ideas in perspective because right. when one lens wins you kind of all lose so it's i mean we've touched on a couple of things here and, and i got a couple of questions from mike in chat uh, which i think touch on this very closely one one is he says and i'm going to give you an opportunity to talk about this uh, it it appears to him that uh, the ontology of the educational domain was really well understood by sakai in a way that it, it, it seems um, the vendors and institutions consuming services have retreated from. Uh, would, you, uh, would you agree with that? I, I would agree with that. And, um, and at, at some point, the question is whether this is a place for learning or a place for management, right? And so I would say that among the LMSs, Sakai is a very strong at the learning side of it. Um, that's not to say that management's unimportant, right? The management's also important. I think we have to meet, meet, meet both of those. But the fact that there have been, there's really no major decision in Sakai where a faculty member or a teacher of some kind is nearby to say at least, wait, 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 right? And so we don't end up off in the deep weeds, uh, running far away from what teachers and faculty want. We have very influential teachers who have learned to talk to developers, right? They're not just, they don't come in and yell. 
Um, you know, and they come from the strangest small tiny schools because they just happen to love talking to developers and making their cases and pitching to us. And then we're like, oh yeah, now that you describe it, I know how to do that. And so it's really cool to see uh, faculty and IT staff um, able to really come right into the inner core of Sakai and help with the steering of the whole thing. And then there's a second usability question. I'm, I'm framing it as a usability question. Um, you know, one aspect of the one audience for an open source project is the developers working on it. And one yep. aspect of usability is how, how easy it for, is it for them to make changes to the project? Have you ever felt like the, the Java toolbox gets in the way? And have you ever regretted that choice uh, over something that would, uh, in again, in the in the phrase uh, that Mike uses, would yeah. give individual developers a longer lever? So, so I have regretted um, a little bit all Java choices for as long as I can remember. On the other hand, a lot of people are use Java to do a lot of things today. And what's happened is, is that the Java from 2002 is very different than the Java from 2021. And, you know, part of our problem is all the legacy we're dragging around. We wrote code in 2002 that's still working and it's impressive that it does still, still work. Tell me, tell me a vendor who has code from 2002 that's not written in Java that's still working, right? Red Hat, C. <laughs> okay, C. <laughs> right. I rest my case. I would see, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. C is a great language for that very reason, right? Um, Python itself, right? You know, Perl was written in C. All these things are written in C, and so that's that's absolutely true. And it's that doesn't mean that C is easy nor fun, right? But it keeps working over the years because it, it, it makes us as programmers express very carefully what it is that we want, right? And, and but Java has gotten a lot better and uh, Java continues to get better. Uh, there was a scary time when Oracle first took over Java that was a little bit scary but, uh, and Spring and Hibernate used to be far worse than they are. I mean, I used to hate them and now I just kind of mildly dislike them. And so our, our biggest problem is that we have a bit of legacy smear because we're old and, um, and so, but it's, it, it doesn't hurt as much as you think. And one of the things that we're doing is we're using web components to slowly but surely take out so that we don't end up with, um, complex markup bits that are sort of crafted in Java server faces in velocity in time leaf in RSF. And so the fact that we have this smear, we can go back and kind of use web components to kind of reduce the, the impact of that smear. So we can have uh, things that look the same, things that function the same by, by taking legacy bits and, and sh making the markup coming out of them smaller and smaller and using web components. And that's a, that's an important thing that we're doing right now that makes it easier to do it. I, I at this point, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get rid of Java at this point. It's getting okay. so much better, so much faster. And um, I, I guess I wish that we could take the Java that we have right now, time travel back to 2002 and write Java in 2002, the way you could write Java today. And so we're seeing a lot of um, refreshing of the code inside Sakai taking advantage of a lot of Java features. Right. Well, um, I'd like to thank you for joining me. I, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, I see it's been that. a fascinating conversation as always. Uh, thanks for joining me this week. Um, we will be getting this session up on YouTube, uh, as I mentioned before we, we joined. So this will be up on YouTube as soon as possible, It'll be probably later today. Um, next week, I'm joined by Stephen Wally and Jeff Borek, Stephen uh, Wally of, of Microsoft, Jeff Borek of IBM, who have uh, been, they've, they've got a long running Abbott and Costello, um, Laurel and Hardy routine. Uh, I'm mischaracterizing it a little bit. And um, uh, whether open source business models exist. And we're going to dig in and have a really, um, uh, hopefully, deep conversation on what it means. Uh, what, what that phrase means, an open source business model, what it means to develop a business model around an open source project. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, again, thank you, uh, Chuck, for joining me. Thank you. And uh, have a good have a good day, everybody. And I'll be tuning in to your uh, live. Uh, what, is it, is session. it available? Yeah, the Quora session. I'll uh, have that. I'll tweet that. Live Quora session done. in an hour, right? And, uh, yeah. and I'll be, uh, is it an hour or two hours? Is it? Uh, One o'clock. 
an hour from right now. One o'clock Eastern. Yeah, one o'clock Eastern. Yeah. Then, uh, then by the way, I'll... Steve Wally and I crossed paths in IEEE POSIX back in the really, really, really old days. <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, okay, well, uh, thanks for joining me and uh, have a good day, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>